So welcome everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, neuro, uh, about uh, CNN architecture. And so far, uh, during the previous lecture, we learned about uh, this component of a convolution and neural network. Uh, we talk about convolution and layers, about max pooling, batch normalization. But actually, we didn't discuss on how to combine those uh, those uh, components together to create a convolution uh, neural network. And this task is, uh, is actually quite hard. There's many possibilities on how we can combine those components together. And especially if we are taking into account the number of in inter inner uh, parameters of each uh, component. For example, we have many uh, activation functions that we can choose from. We have, uh, we can need to, we need to uh, choose the number of channels in the convolution layer, okay? In, in addition, um, we will see in, the, in, in, the, in this lecture that uh, even trying to connect this, uh, those components is completely uh, non-tribal. So in today's lecture, we're gonna go through some uh, uh, known uh, uh, architectures, okay? And we are going to do so by going over uh, the winners of the ImageNet uh, classification challenge. So what is the ImageNet uh, classification challenge? ImageNet is a, is a large data set of images, okay, around uh, 14 uh, million images. And the visual recognition challenge, the ILSVLC, have uh, around 1.2 uh, training images, uh, around 100K uh, testing images for uh, 1,000 categor categor categories. Okay, and it used to be an annual uh, challenge and we're gonna see some uh, three uh, winners of the, this challenge. We're gonna see Alex Ness from 2012. Uh, they were the first neural network to win the challenge using uh, neural networks. We're gonna see VGG that actually won the second place, but uh, they have really nice architecture. So we're gonna go through it. And ResNet uh, in, from 2015 that uh, take to, took for the extreme, the meaning of uh, deep uh, learning. And we're gonna see they use uh, a lot of uh, layers. Uh, since this uh, challenge uh, finished in 2017, we're gonna see an additional network that's called EfficientNet that, uh, try to, uh, to improve both the accuracy and efficiency of uh, those networks. Um, and in addition, in the end, we're gonna talk a bit about transfer learning, which is not an architecture, but is highly, uh, it's a topic that is highly close to uh, architecture. Uh, so let's start. Uh, so the first winner of, uh, of the ImageNet, uh, uh, ImageNet uh, classification challenge that use uh, neural networks was AlexNet by uh, uh, Krzyzewski, Siskever, and uh, Hinton. And the, you can see in the bar in, the, in this graph over here, sorry. Uh, here we see uh, the winner of each uh, year of the classification challenge. Um, and we see in the blue, the top five error of the model, which means top five is uh, is, uh, is, 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 is your, uh, uh, is the correct prediction was in your top five uh, prediction of your model, okay? So if your five predictions, your five top predictions include the correct prediction, you get uh, score one and otherwise you get uh, zero. So this is the error of the previous uh, models that doesn't, didn't use uh, neural networks. In orange here, we can see the number of layers for each model. So this, uh, those models didn't have uh, any layers. And here we see Alex Ness from 2012, which have uh, eight layers and achieve a 16.5 error rate. And it seems uh, not that much, but actually it's uh, quite a big deal. Okay, since uh, till 2012, not a lot of uh, the improvement of, uh, of the classification challenge uh, didn't improve uh, so much. And here AlexNet with, uh, where, with the, they were the first to uh, use convolution network with, uh, for this test uh, was, uh, was able to uh, 
reduce the error by uh, 10%, which is a major improvement. And this is what led to this uh, deep learning era that we are currently living. Okay, so it's really important uh, paper uh, that's called Alex. Uh, it's important to mention that even before uh, AlexNet, there used to be uh, ConvNet and uh, neural networks. Asaf talked about it in, this, in his uh, lectures. Uh, there was a network by, by Fukushima and Lacoon. Uh, but AlexNet is, first of all, it's, um, it's architecture that is more uh, close to uh, the architect architecture that we uh, use today. And also it was the first network that was able to train on such large and complex uh, data sets such as uh, images. So let, let's uh, look on the architecture. Okay, so as we said before, uh, AlexNet is a deep network. It has uh, eight layers, five uh, convolutional layer layers here and uh, three uh, fully connected layers. Comparing to uh, to Lacoon network that uh, to Lenet that have only five layers, it, it is much more deeper uh, network. Um, so every uh, every uh, layer here is a, a convolution layer. We have those uh, three convolutional layers that stack upon each other. Okay, and we have those uh, max pooling. Um, after the convolution layer that actually is similar to, to modern architecture where after each uh, pooling, we increase the number of channels. Okay, so here we, uh, we have uh, 48 channels and then we increase the number of channels to 128, okay? They also were uh, used radio activation while Lenet used uh, tan age. They use max pooling instead of average pooling a dropout, batches, and a momentum. Um, additional feature of, uh, of uh, this network that uh, from the, uh, they used to be, uh, they were the phase to, to train on uh, GPUs. And GPUs in those times wasn't big enough for networks. So what we see here, the split here, they actually have had to split their network into two GPUs and train this uh, network separately uh, and then use those connections between the GPUs in order to create a single network. Okay, so this was more because of a uh, technical problem instead of uh, uh, something that is uh, relevant for the network. Um, any question about AlexNet? Basically, it's like two networks running in parallel, like. 48 in the first layer, it's like two times 48 filters running in I, parallel. Actually, you sound a bit, uh, uh, I don't hear you so much. Can you speak a bit, uh, a bit louder? Yes. So, actually, running on these two GPUs means that, in, let's say, in the first layer, it's not 48 filters, it's actually 96 filters running in parallel. Yeah, exactly. So, this is the 96 uh, channels. Here is the uh, uh, to uh, to uh, 252. Yeah. Okay, thanks. But they have this uh, connection between them to, to deal with it. Thanks. Okay, so this is the, uh, the major, uh, this is AlexNet. It was a really uh, big, uh, it really important paper uh, that have a lot of effect on, on our current research uh, today. Um, a question? Okay. Yeah. Can you remind why uh, the max pooling increases the number of channels? Maybe I'm misremembering. Um, yeah, so the max pooling didn't uh, increase the number of channels. Uh, it is the, ma the max pooling reduced the number, the resolution, okay, the spatial dimension. Uh, and the convolutional layers, uh, they are uh, increase the number of the, of the uh, channels. Okay, so they have a max pooling and comp layer that reduce the number of, uh, reduce the resolution and increase the number of uh, channels. So the transition from looking at like the block that's 27 by 27 by 128 to the next one, that's both the convolution and the max pooling together? 
you talk about this uh, this uh, yeah and to the yeah. next one mm -hmm. okay yeah. thanks actually i'm here i'm not sure who, who come first okay the pooling or the conflict but in general the pooling come first and then the, the conflict um okay so uh the network that won the 2013 challenge uh, is called uh, zfnet by zeller and Fregus. actually it's uh it's pretty similar to alexnet but with different par parameters it also have uh, eight uh, layers and achieve my 11.7 uh, uh, error rate but it's because it's quite similar to alexnet we are gonna skip it uh, today and we're gonna talk about uh, VGG. Okay, so VGG is a network by Simonian and uh, Zisaman. And uh, it didn't uh, actually won the 2014 challenge and they won the second place in the classification, but they won other challenge uh, in, the, in that year. And VGG have this uh, really nice and beautiful architecture. Uh, they have uh, 19 layers um where they have those convolutional blocks okay where have we have three by six convolutions okay repeated uh, two times here or four times here and after each uh, convolutional block we have a pooling and we increase the number of channels okay as and then after all the um, after these five convolutional blocks we have a fully connected layers and a softmax. Okay, and this nice and simple uh, looking uh, network actually uh, was able to uh, get a 7.3 uh, error, error rate. And there is a, actually there is a reason why uh, using uh, three by three convolution, convolution instead of using uh, five by five convolution or 11 by 11 convolutions as uh, as uh, was done in uh, AlexNet. And uh, let's uh, examine those uh, two options. Okay, so for example, if we have a five by five convolution and we compare it to a different block when we have two convolutional layers of uh, kernel three uh, stuck upon each other. Okay, here we have a single uh, five by five convolution and here we have two three by three convolutional layers. And uh, we're gonna compare those two uh, functions and try to find out which one is better. So let's look on the receptive fields of both uh, those networks. What will be the receptive field for the five by five convolution? This will be uh, your part to answer. Anyone? 25. 25 pixels. Sorry? 25 pixels. 25 people, so it will be uh, five, five, on, five on five, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we just write uh, five. What will be the receptive field of uh, this uh, of this block? Five I think the same. The same, right. It will be five for both of them. Okay, why, why is that? Um, if we have, just a second. If we have this, uh, oh, it's not a board, then, sorry. Doesn't. Okay, so if we have these uh, all layers, these uh, layers, uh, five by five convolution will give us something like this. The receptive field will be five. And um, if we have three by three convolution, the receptive field will be something like that. And then uh, we will have another three by six convolution, it will give us uh, this one. Okay, so the receptive field will be similar. Sorry, my pen doesn't work, it started not working, so sorry for the ugly painting. Okay, is it clear? 
Okay, so a more uh, difficult question. What will be the number of parameters for each block? So in the first case, it will be five by five by C. Uh, right, and with the, and it's, oh, so I forgot to mention that the input channels are C and the output channel channels are also C. So what will be, it will be in total? 25 C. 25 C squared. C squared, sir. Yeah, yeah okay. Mm -hmm. So it will be, oh, 25 C squared. Okay, uh, because we have 25 C for each kernel, and then uh, we have C channels, so we have 25 C squared. The same for the uh, two convolution layers, we have 18 uh, C squared. Um, a bit more difficult, what will be the number of floating point operations when we consider a multiplication and adding as a single operation? So. Does anyone have any idea? Okay, so the number of each operation, the kernel size is 20, 35 by C, right? So each, uh, each operation of the kernel will take us 25 by C. The input uh, for our network, it's age by W. Okay, so for a single channel, we will have 25 by C by age of by W. But then for all the channel, the output, we will have 25 C squared age W. Um, if it's not, if it's not clear, uh, that's okay. You can just go through it uh, after the class, but, it, but this is an important uh, calculation. Okay, so we will have 24, 25 C squared age W and 18 C squared age W for the uh, three by C block. Okay, so actually we have here, uh, if we want to compare those two uh, functions, the three by three convolution layer is much more complex um, function, right? Because it have two convolution layers separated by activation and so forth. Uh, it's much more complicated than the five by five convolution. Okay, but they have, but even though it's more uh, complicated, it's have the same receptive field, it's have less parameter, and it's a bit more efficient. Okay, this is why they used only three by three convolution in this uh, VGG architecture. What is the disadvantage of this uh, of this uh, architecture? Does anyone have a maybe a guess? What about the memory size of the output? What will be the output size uh, in terms of memory? Um, okay, so the 5 by 5 convolution, all those convolutions preserve their, uh, it's a 5 by 5 convolution with write one and uh, uh, zero and one value. Okay, so the output will be the same as the input, it will be HWC. But instead, but here we have uh, two convolution layers, so actually the memory size will be double. Okay, so this network uh, will consume a lot of memory uh, in our system. And we can see it in the following di diagram. Okay, Wait, can, here, you, can you explain again why it will be double? Uh, because we have a single output from this first layer, right? The, the first layer uh, produce uh, some output of size HWC because those convolution layer preserve the uh, input size. But then the second convolution layer have the same output size. So we have HWC for this layer and HWC for that layer. So, so it's not the, out, the final output, it's just the memory. It's between each layer also. Yeah, the memory that okay. we use to calculate okay, the okay, okay, sure. okay, which is important for backpropagation as, as we saw before. Okay. No. So we, yeah. In between the convolutional layers, do you have something or just they are 
Yeah, you the, the, we have the regular stuff, uh, activation. And, and ah, it's okay. So this is why, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, they separate each, uh, I, saw, I think it will, I thought it will be obvious, but every convolution he, uh, network here and in Alex uh, net, they have, uh, they, uh, have their uh, nonlinear activation after each uh, convolution level. Um, okay, so we can also see it in this following di diagram. Okay, we have, here we see all the layers of the VGG network. Okay, and for each uh, layer, we see in blue the memory uh, size of the output. Okay, and we can see that in this architecture, we, we use a lot of memory, especially in the first uh, layers where we have uh, a, a huge resolution, okay, H by W, which is the image resolution, and a lot of channels. Okay, so we have a really uh, huge amount of memory on our first uh, layers. We can also see here in gray uh, the number of uh, floating operations uh, during our uh, during uh, in our layers. We can see it, uh, that this is quite constant, which is uh, good. And in orange, we see the number of parameters for each layer, and we can see that in the fully connected layers, we use a lot of uh, of uh, parameters. Okay, and we will see how we can uh, reduce the size in uh, previous in the uh, following article. Any questions about uh, VGG? Great. Actually, parameters also translate to memory, right? Yeah, they also uh, affect the memory, but um, um, we this is like it's like a different memory because if we are using a bigger batch. We don't uh, we don't change uh, the parameters, but we have more uh, memory size. So what are the What are the units on the right hand side? On the right hand side, it's uh, it's just the number of parameters in uh, millions, I think. Okay, so or, that's why it looks like the first couple of layers are literally like zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I forgot to answer it, but uh, sorry, correct. I think it's millions, but uh, I will check. Um, okay. Any question about the VGG? Great. So the actual winner of the two two thousand and fourteen uh, challenge was uh, Google, uh, which has some interesting insight about efficiency of uh, networks, but we don't have time to go through it today. But if uh, any one of you is interested, he, there is plenty of inf information about it online. And uh, I really recommend uh, to go through it. It's really interesting. And they have uh, 22 layers and achieved the error rate of 6.7. And our next uh, architecture is uh, ResNet, okay, which uh, actually were the first to introduce really a uh, deep uh, network okay they used they were able to train a network of 152 uh, layers and achieve a uh, really uh, good accuracy and then they actually were able the first to demonstrate how the power of uh, what is the power of deep network okay we can see that as long as we uh, the, if we increase the number of layers we were able to achieve much better uh, accuracy um, okay, so uh, I forget to mention ResNet by E et al. and published in CBPR uh, 2016. Um, okay, so what is the idea behind uh, ResNet? In uh, 2015, uh, people started to use uh, batch normal normalization. Uh, you learn about batch normalization in the previous lecture. And using batch normalization, they were able to train a network that are quite deep, around 20 layers. But when they tried to, uh, to train deeper network, they got the following uh, phenomenon. OK, they uh, took two networks, one with 20 layers and the second with 56 uh, layers. And look uh, at the test error uh, during their iteration. 
Okay, so this is the 20 layers, this is the 56 layers. And if we look on this, uh, this graph, what we can say that our problem is, what do you think? Any or idea? Maybe the problem is with vanishing gradients because the, the network is too deep. Just it's too hard for the network to learn. The... That's correct, but it's a uh, two step forward. But when you see a overfitting, graph, yeah, overfitting. So, but how can it... we see the overfitting effect between two networks? It's not a train and test error, it's just the test error. Yeah, so overfitting is a problem when we overfit the data that causing us to um, get a worse prediction. Right, so 55, uh, 56 layer have much more, have much more expressive expressive power than twenty with a network than with twenty layers, right? Ooh, it, it it doesn't look like a, I guess the question is it doesn't look like a classic overfitting kind of curve because it's not that the tester starts increasing. Um. Yeah, that's correct, but um, but in general, we, we, we will expect that the, uh, that the test error uh, with, uh, with a network that is more expressible, right? You understand it? That why 56 layers is more expressible? It will be, uh, it will have a better performance than 20 layer network, right? And this is why I know if it's, it could be an example of overfit. Okay, because we have the, the layer overfit the data, so we can uh, so we our prediction of are not uh, are not uh, good enough. Okay, so truly, as you said, when we're looking on a training error, we can see that it's truly not an overfitting uh, problem; it's an optimization problem. Okay, because here we see that the network, the the bigger network couldn't converge even to the training error. Okay? So you were two steps ahead, but that's good. So um, why, is, why this is weird? Okay, so 56 layers um, have much, got to have the same expressive power as 20, uh, 20 layers network. We can see it easily by if we're just taking a 20 layers network, we can just uh, edit an identity layers, okay, like 36 identity layers, and we will get the 56 layers that have the same accuracy and performance as the 20 layer, the 20 layers network, okay. So the deeper network much have to be uh, as good as uh, the shallower network. And, and they use this uh, observation of uh, identity mapping to create uh, the residual, uh, to create a residual block that they will use in uh, ResNet. So, so far we saw a convolutional block that looked like a three by three convolutions followed by another uh, three by three convolution. And we have our input X and those two convolution create a function f of x. Okay. Now, if we encourage, if we want to encourage the, net, the network to use an identity mapping, uh, we can do uh, one simple uh, action, and is to insert an identity mapping to this block. Okay. So now, instead of trying to learn a function f of x. We take, uh, instead of the output to be f of x, our output will be f of x plus the identity mapping. So if we want to keep the identity mapping, all we need to do is just use a uh, zero weight in this layer, okay? And uh, another intuition to that is that we, uh, we try to learn only a small residual to our input, okay? So instead of, trying to learning to try to map uh, trying to map uh, our input to a better input we try to uh, find some small residual that will improve our uh, prediction in a bit 
you can think about it more in the with more deeper layers. Okay, probably in the deeper layers, we have already some information about the image, and probably our uh, representation of the input is quite uh, good. So it's probably harder to uh, to take a good input and try to learn a better input from this already good input. Okay, so instead of that, here we're trying to take this good input and find some small residual that will help it to, uh, to improve our uh, already good uh, input. Is that clear? I hope so. So uh, actually, do all, so yeah. how, how does it help? I, I missed the, the, like the point, so. Uh, this is the intu intuitive uh, thing on how, it, the, first of all, experimentally, it's helped a lot. Okay, um, it's a, this is the intuitive behind this model. Okay, and uh, we will see how it's helped the vanishing gradient in a few more uh, slides. Okay, so uh, as we said, uh, yeah, another question. How is it defined? Because I think f of x and x are not of the same dimension. Actually, here it's uh, the same dimension, right? Because uh, we talked about it. Uh, that those are three by three convolution with stride one and padding one. So the, out, the input size is similar to the output size, but we will also see later, we can talk about later how we can reduce the, the spatial size or increase the number of standards. Um, is there any intuition for why the kind of residual is, is additive as opposed to multiplicative? Uh, you said we have to, uh, um uh, we can also take this input and multiply it element wise with x yeah and then maybe kind of the starting point is not that f of x is in initialized to zeros it's like initialized to all ones or something yeah so it's not uh, all one. it has to be the identity and it's quite difficult to achieve it with convolutions so and multiplications are harder to uh, differentiate through um, mm -hmm. So it's much more simpler uh, and more stable just to, to compute residuals. Uh, sorry for the intervention though. Oh, great. You can also think about it like it's more gentle operation, like adding than multiplying. Uh, so this is also a good intuition. Um, okay, so we talk about ResNet that we, that we can add some small residual and even actually also uh, draw it like uh, this, right? So this is the same drawing, but it just uh, flipped, okay? And we, if we stack uh, two uh, residual blocks one after each other, we can see that actually the, in, the, the, uh, the input preserved all along the way, and we just uh, learn some small residuals that we are adding to our input, okay? And if we uh, do it several times, we get a ResNet of 34 uh, layers. Okay, for uh, the one where, uh, okay, so what we have here, we have uh, all, all those ones are residual blocks. The different color represent uh, different uh, stages, okay? Where at each stages, we repeated uh, those blocks. And then at the end of the, of the stage, we uh, reduce the number of, uh, we increase, sorry, the number of channels and reduce the spatial size, okay? We do it here not by max pooling, we actually do it by convolution network with uh, Sprite 2, okay? And we do it again here, we increase, decrease the number of channel, they increase the number of channel and decrease the uh, resolution uh, till the end. Um, we can actually uh, increase the depth of this net network quite easily. We can do it by just stacking more uh, ResNet block inside each uh, stage. Okay, and by that we can uh, expand our network. And as we said before, they were able to train in this way, in this way a network of, of 152 uh, layers. Um, we asked before uh, about uh, how we can uh, match the, the size of, of the output. 
I, I did. Okay, so here, for example, we have this uh, problem that we talk about uh, because here the, the input is uh, have less uh, channels and it's a bit bigger, right? It's uh, twice the size of the resolution. Okay, so for doing it, for doing it they uh, use or uh, one by one convolution with try two or uh, just uh, zero padding and also sprite two. Okay. Cool, thanks. Um, okay, so another interesting fact uh, that we see here when we concatenate all those residual blocks uh, one on top of each other is uh, when we look at the gradient of this point, okay, we have an addition of the gradient of the, in, of the input with some uh, output of f of, of f of x, and if we if you remember uh, f of x plus the plus x will cause the gradient to uh, split and take two directions. The one will take this uh, skip connection, and the second will take um, will go through this uh, function here. And actually, it will cause the gradient to go all the way from the loss to uh, to our first uh, network for, for our first layer. Okay, and if and if we talked before about vanishing gradient and why skip connection helped to solve the vanishing gradient, this is the this is the the reason. Okay, because the the gradient can propagate easily from the loss directly to the first uh, layer. Okay. Uh, two more uh, interesting feature that they uh, use in Red Hat. They actually took it from uh, from Google Net, but we're gonna talk about it uh, here. Uh, if you remember correctly, VGG layers have this huge amount of memory in uh, in the beginning, right? So they wanted to avoid it in Red Hat, and this is why they used a drastic and aggressive max pooling at the beginning. By taking a seven by seven convolution layer and with try two and pulling layer with try two, reducing the size of uh, of the input in the cell layer to be uh, fifty six by fifty six, and this reduced the amount of memory and uh, quite well. Okay, so we do, we're doing this aggressive uh, pulling to uh, avoid this huge number of. Uh, of this used memory usage here in the first uh, few layers. Um, the second uh, feature that they use, they wanted to reduce the number of parameters in the less fully connected layers. Okay, they didn't want to use so many uh, fully connected layers. So if we are looking on the 56 input that we saw here, okay, here we're doing um, uh, pooling. So the input will be 28 by 28. Another pooling, we will have 14 by 14. And in the end, we will have a seven by seven by 520 uh, uh, vector. Now, they actually use average pooling with kernel size of seven. But actually, the all input is seven by seven. So it's just a global average pooling of each channel. Okay, so they just take the average of each channel to create a vector of size 512. Okay, and take this uh, vector and use another fully connected layer to uh, get their final prediction. And this is how they reduce this uh, amount of parameters that they use in the fully connected layers. Any question about it? But raise that before we continue. Yes. Uh, yes, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I understand the intuition of what they're trying to do, and uh, I, I am completely positive that uh, this works, but I was wondering if they empirically showed that uh, training this model like causes some convolutional layers to have a kernel of zero and uh, learn the identity or just a residual. Um, um, if they have an identity, I don't think so that they show it like they have a weight of zero. Uh, I don't I don't familiar with any work that. There are a lot of spin-off works around this architecture. It's very uh, uh, key to a lot of architectures. 
there are some works that try to do efficient uh, learning with uh, based on ResNet by learning how many times you need to go through each of the uh, stages. So basically they trained each stage to have shared weights, the, the blocks. And for easy images, it was easy to run them like one, uh, one block at each, if I can annotate this. Um, maybe we'll, but we'll take it maybe offline because we don't yes, have yes. a lot of time. Sorry, sorry. Um, All right. So I will skip a bit. There is a uh, much more uh, architecture that uh, trying to improve uh, resin in both uh, field. One is like the accuracy. We have work like dense net, resin net, and uh, and I've always forget the name. Uh, Squid and excitation network. And uh, there's a lot of interesting work, but you don't have time to go through them uh, in this uh, tutorial. Uh, there are also networks that try to improve the efficiency, uh, like MobileNet and ShovelNet, where they try to get similar accuracy as, uh, as ResNet, but with le much less uh, parameters or number of uh, floating point operations. And in the time we have left, I'm going to show you uh, an, a different uh, model that's called Efficient Net. We try to uh, do both. Okay, Efficient Net asks you the question, ask you the opposite question. Okay, they ask you how many uh, resources do we have? And given this amount of resources, I will find you the best model that use this amount uh, of resources. Okay. So they have this model that we can uh, scale to any amount of resources that we currently have. So for example, if I train a simple model in my local computer, and then I want to uh, train the same, to use the same model to train it on a cloud with a lot of computational power, instead of uh, design a new architecture, I will just scale up this uh, model that I have and uh, try and, and train this model on uh, on the uh, on the environment that have much more resources. So this is the efficient net by uh, uh, Tan and Lee uh, from 2019, and uh, their best model achieved a three percent of error, and they it's really really deep uh, network with 813 uh, layers. So um actually how they do it how they do it so we have our basic uh, architecture okay that we saw here when we already saw before we, where we have those uh, stages uh, here and uh, we have those uh, ch channels here look the, uh, just know that the channels here are in the width direction uh, as opposed to what we saw before and the resolution is like the depth so it's a bit confusing but uh, it's the same and they actually noticed that there are three different ways to, uh, to expand our model. Okay, and we can use a wider network with more channels. We can, we can use a deeper network as we saw in ResNet, we just add more layers. And we have a higher resolution uh, network where we use um, images with more resolution. And there are several worlds that try to expand a single, uh, each one of these, uh, by each one of these methods. And then say here that uh, we can just uh, expand one of those, uh, uh, one of these parameters, you have to expand your model altogether. Okay, and a simple example it for it, a simple example it for it is when you increase the resolution of your image. If you increase the resolution of your image, you need a bigger receptive field, right? Because you increase the resolution. So you need a deeper network. On the other end, if you incre increase the resolution, you need more channels in order to find, in order to catch the fine details that you have in those more details image. Okay, and that's what they try to do here. They try to find the parameters that we can scale our models, um, scale the model in all of these uh, parameters. Okay, so have, I don't have time to get into those uh, model. They actually modelize this, uh, the, how to scale the model and they find those uh, parameters. 
and, and the parameter that let you scale the model and ha they have this factor of P. And then if you want to uh, increase your model by two to the power of P, you just increase those uh, the model by, by this uh, factor, okay? So I don't have time for it. If anyone uh, want to uh, talk about it offline, I will be happy to uh, show you this. And they, have, and they show some uh, really interesting uh, results. They have this basic model that they have, uh, which is B0. And they, then they just scale this uh, model till uh, B6, okay? And we can actually see here that if we're taking a uh, compare ResNet 152 layers, we, we compare it to B5, which have the same number of floating point operation, but is, it is much more accurate uh, than the ResNet. And also uh, like uh, ResNet 101 have the same accuracy as uh, B3, but, have, but B3 have much fewer uh, parameters. Uh, floating or floating point operation. So, okay. So, uh, same architecture uh, conclusion. Um, design your network according to your tasks and resources. Okay. Uh, take into the consideration when you design your architectures uh, about uh, the parameters, the number of floating point operation, and the memory size. Uh, use identity mapping, skip connection. To, uh, to avoid uh, vanishing gradient. And the most to uh, uh, note that I wanted to take uh, home is don't try to uh, redesign your uh, architecture from scratch. Use uh, existing architectures, use existing uh, stages as we saw before, but don't try to uh, redesign your architecture. And even more than that, most most of the time you don't have to uh, pre-train uh, you don't even have to train your model you can use a pre-trained uh, model by using uh, transfer learning so uh, in short what is uh, transfer learning uh, consider that you uh, uh, train some uh, train some networks on ImageNet and we have some nice uh, nice result with good accuracy, and we have a really good uh, network. What will happen if now, instead of inserting uh, an ImageNet uh, image, you will answer it uh, something like an uh, ultrasound image? What will happen next? So apparently, uh, this, the classification probably will be nonsense because it's ir irrelevant for the test. But if we look on the deep feature here that we have here, Apparently, they have a good representation of the original image. Okay, so instead of trying to uh, get those uh, features from scratch, we can just fix those uh, those parameters of the network, get this um, get this uh, good representation of the image using those uh, fixed parameters. And then just train a linear, a single linear model for your current task. And this is uh, this uh, transfer learning will uh, save you a lot, a lot of time. So it's really recommended not to use, not to train your model from scratch, but to use uh, transfer learning. That's all for today. Sorry for uh, being a bit, uh, a bit rushed in the end. Uh, any questions? In transfer learning, you usually train only the last layer, or you you can like remove several of the last layer in order to get better results. Yeah, you can actually you can play with it. You can also uh, you can also train uh, like few networks, a uh, few, few layers, as you said. And it is also like after you finish the train, uh, training those uh, last layers, you can also do a fine tuning on all the networks to uh, to get some even better result uh, using this network. But usually, what, what usually is done is, is uh, only the last layer or retraining several? Yeah. I think it layers. depends on your task. So I think it's good to start with a single layer and then, but uh, there are more expert people there here than me. So maybe they have an additional thing to test. It usually depends on how much data you have for the new task. 
So if you have very few examples, then you, on, you can only hope to train the last layer. But if you have many examples, you can use the pre-trained weights as the initial point and start training all the net from that initial point. As we saw in the lecture earlier this week, uh, finding a good initial point is not trivial. So if you have uh, weights that are performing well on ImageNet, they are probably good uh, weights and stable, and they probably will be a good initial point for whatever task you are doing that uses natural or natural-ish images. Okay, I thought that maybe when trying to do transfer learning to a very different uh, type of uh, images, let's say from dogs to ultrasounds instead of from dogs to cats, then you might want to train more of the last layers. Is, is this is the, the right so kind when of we thinking did, about it? So when we worked with ultrasound images, we trained all the layers, uh, but we had enough data to afford, to, to allow for this. But if we, uh, sometimes it's very difficult to get more data and uh, it, it doesn't make sense to train all the weights. Okay. So you have to Thanks. freeze the network and use only the top uh, layers. Sometimes if you have really, really few examples, what you can do is uh, use the deep features and then train uh, a linear classifier uh, like a support vector machine or, or a ridge regression uh, that has a more global uh, um, a solution for a small set of features than using stochastic gradient descent. But it's all a trade off between how much training data you have for the new task and how, conf how different this new task is from natural images. Okay, thanks.